um, when these transactions and this interaction with my backend uh, will, will will hit my servers, what's going to happen there? If it all uh, if all the requests will come down at a certain time, or will it spread evenly? Um, I can I do not really have um, experience, or I can't tell how the interaction with my backend backend will be compared to if you have a desktop application. You know, okay, office times are from nine to five, and you know the load will will come in this time. Here you have always to be prepared. Um, uh, another topic coming up here is when you have all these automated background processes running, where sometimes as a user you don't see that the, your your mobile device is synchronizing data with the backend. So it's really a machine to machine conversation going on here. And as you know, if there's a bug or something, you will never see that maybe hundred thousands or a million of users are now uh, making making a lot of connections against your, your servers. I will give you an example later for this. Um, another topic is a responsive UI and the usage of asynchronous APIs. Um, typically, if you're building web services, uh, you have this, okay, I send a request to the server and I will get a response. But um, very often you, you build your mobile applications in a way that you send a request, you don't block the UI thread, people can, can work with their devices, the, the request is going to, to your servers, and then <coughs> sometime later the reply is, is provided. But in the meantime, the user might have closed, closed the app, so it's not of any interest anymore, res the response. And um, it makes it really difficult sometimes to find the right granularity of how many calls you make from your mobile device to your backend, what data you provide, when you provide it, and for your interface design. Um, one common approach, which does not apply all the time, is think about, okay, I send a request, and maybe I get get back a URL or a yeah, uh, REST resource, which I can use then sometime later to get the results from my request. Now, these are all some, some things uh, depending on, on your requirements, but th these, these are new things to consider when you're being building. Uh, I'm just curious, can you give me an example of your own work where that, yeah. where you would do that? Um, one example is for the synchronization architecture. Um, we we manipulate a lot of data uh, locally because you don't own, always have um, connectivity to your servers. It's, it's, a, it's an application for farmers in, in Africa, so they have really bad internet connection. So they work the whole day, and there's a lot of data to be synchronized with the back end. So one thing is to send the data to, to the server. On the server, there are some, uh, some rules, a rules engine to compute uh, how the merging has to be done, the conflict resolution has to be done, and you just get, you never know how long this will take. There are even some conflicts we need um, manual intervention on the server side where you have this, uh, uh, somebody will, will get an email saying, hey, here, I, I don't know which data is the correct one. You have to resolve this, and this can take maybe days or a day. So essentially what you're sending back is like a, a ticket. Yeah, it's a ticket. Okay. Yeah, and it's, it's a different, yeah, a different kind of architecture and interaction model, which based on what you want to do, uh, yeah, it's, it's it's valid on some use cases. Okay, so another topic, I think <coughs> everybody was this one, uh, push notifications. Um, and this brings for, for your servers some, some other challenges because uh, you have different platforms to integrate. If, you, if you're providing mobile solutions for Android and and iOS and BlackBerry, you have different different clouds to use in backend sy systems. And um, for example, we, we had this interesting project where the, our customer wanted to be notify the users at the same time about a special event. 
but we had roughly one and a half million users and uh, put, to send a push notification to, to the Asia Cloud, this was a Windows Phone uh, project, roughly took one second for the round trip. Okay. Now, if you do the math, you know you can't you can't make sure that all the users will be notified at the same time. So uh, it's a real uh, scaling challenge if you want to use push notifications for for a large user base, uh, because it's not only ten requests, might be a million requests, <coughs> and maybe you have many applications with different kinds of push notifications. This can really become a bottleneck. In, in your architecture if you're using push notifications. And one, one approach to solve this are, are web sockets, but on mobile devices it's, it's okay, but sometimes difficult. As, as I mentioned, we have limited resources and unstable networks. And with limited resources, I mean, if, if you uh, leave connections open to every mobile device which, which connects, um, you might run out of connections and threads on your server side. Yeah. And also, how do you recover if I am driving in my car and the cell towers change and I maybe get disconnected all the time? This is really difficult to, to uh, resolve with that sockets. And like I mentioned, uh, from one moment to, to the other, if you want to provide this for, for multi, multiple platforms, you have to um, you have to take care that you know about Asia, uh, Google, C2DM, and Apple push notifications. All different APIs, uh, different technologies, different endpoints, and there's there's a lot to think about if you want to support push notifications. As simple as it may look in, in the first. So then, are you making an argument thing. against them? No, <laughs> no. Um, <coughs> I'm just. Just um, saying that um, if you use, if you use them, if you think this is a building block to your solution, um, it's not like only calling a REST service and everything is fine. It's just this is really work, and as an architect, you um, yeah, you really have to take pay attention to push notification because the, in the first way they look really harmless. Yeah? You get an SDK, a REST endpoint, if you send something to. This, but if you're thinking about the scale, this can really be, be a huge challenge. Um, <coughs> another topic, one of my favorite, um, is security. And uh, actually, one thing with what uh, I heard is, hey, our app is secure, we, we use HTTPS. So, <coughs> There's, we don't have a problem, but uh, these times, men in the middle attacks to um, really um, hack into HTTPS connection. We have a lot of script kiddies which can do it right now. This is based on on the mechanism how HTTPS and the verification of the certificate chains works. Many clients just take the server certificate and they go up the chain. Oh, is there a trusted CA? Okay, I trust this uh, this connection so it can, it can be de decrypted and you can read, read the data. But a lot of these root CAs are, um, are hacked already and available in the internet. So we were able, uh, I didn't believe this <laughs> at first, and then somebody showed me uh, banking applications applications like Square. Uh, Square didn't have this problem, but similar applications, which are really sending um, credit card information and really sensitive data. Where it, was, it took five minutes to get put a man in the middle in between and manipulate the data. For example, sending the amount to a different account or changing the, changing the amount. So HTTPS itself, is not sufficient anymore if your application is really security sensitive. So one solution to this is to use SSL pinning. Uh, this is really to pin against a certain specific certificate and provide the certificate also in your client. 
to use mechanisms like HMA caches, where you can sign your requests and then with, with the same key on the server and on the client and make sure your data has not been manipulated in the meantime during the transfer. So if your app, if your solution is security sensitive, uh, HTTPS alone is not, is not the solution. It's, it takes five minutes <coughs> for an experienced hacker. Okay. And another thing in this regard is, is think, think more about a token-based authorization like like OAuth, where you can um, authorize an, an application to do something, but you have the possibility to, to, to revoke the access and things like this. And uh, all the management of these tokens, etc. There are a lot of, of applications out these days where you don't have, have this, but for a mobile solution, I think it's a, it's a good, good approach here. Yeah. So, speaking about security, another uh, issue we might have here is, is that devices can, can be jail, jailbreak, jailbroken, <coughs> jailbroken. and um, it's sometimes really easy to jailbreak a device and read the directory, the secure sandbox directory of the device and get, for example, the certificates for the HTTPS connection <coughs> and get the passwords out of the keychain. Um, I'm not a hacker, but uh, I've seen some guys from se security companies who, who are doing this professional for, for our clients, doing this really in short amount of time. So this can also be, be a big challenge. So another topic is, topic is apart from security, uh, multi-form factor support. Um, sometimes when you provide, for example, uh, images to your application, you might not know on what device this, this multimedia or image data Will, will be uh, will be used maybe an, an iPhone with free data without reading the display an iPad maybe a Samsung device an old uh, HTC Hero and one way to address this is to provide some image transcoding on the server side so that if you're making a connection you let the server know hey I'm a I'm a device having this resolution and these capabilities, so make sure I only get get this, the <coughs> images and the quality which I can, can display. This saves bandwidth and money for the user and makes your application um, 100 times faster. In the same context, uh, you have to consider content <coughs> optimization to normalize uh, paging mechanisms and also com compress data when you send it over over the network. Um, I think I mentioned it before, because you never know if you provide a mobile solution uh, about the re reliability of your of your data data connection. And today um, we had some some great examples which almost drove me nuts, um, where we had um, the, the connect connectivity is made up of two thin things. I think one, th one, one, uh, one axis is the bandwidth you have. It's how thick is your pipe to get data through, and the other is latency. How fast is your data running through these pipes? And um, we had applications. You have a perfect connection. You have quick ping times, but uh, somehow you only get 200 bytes per second of the wire. And if you have a server connection, you keep this connection, your server will be blocked for endless time. It's a, it's a valid connection. It's not, not disconnected or somehow. And if you have many of these connections with, to your server, uh, you really can run into, into problems. And this can happen very often if you're using mobile devices. And if you're, um, maybe if, you, if you're traveling, and you've switched cell towers, it's, 
it's very often the case if you're using 3G or LTE, I'm not so experienced how, how good the experience is there. But um, this can be really, really a challenge. And of course, <coughs> um, the app update cycles, versioning and evolution. <coughs> it's, 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 it's hard, you develop something, you have a, your app in, in the market, which uses a certain version of your, your backend API, and then you have a fix, you have a new, new feature, you roll it out, but the people do not update the, the apps. So you have to keep your, your APIs, your REST services, your web services, whatever, your application on the server for maybe a very long time, longer when you want to, uh, to keep it. So this can become an interesting are there, are there strategies for forcing update, or are you saying normally you just have to keep completely different versions of services? Um, it's, it's dependent on, on the app you're providing, um, but recently some, some people uh, built some mechanisms into the apps themselves, so to notify users, and even some apps force the user to update. They say, hey, here's a new version available. If you want to continue working with this app, you have to up upgrade. But uh, it, it really, really depends on, uh, on your app and uh, maybe for an enterprise app, this, this is totally fine. Sure, but, but a commercial, yeah, people hate being forced to update. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, they, maybe they will do an update in the form of an uninstall, right? <laughs> and um, yeah, there, there's another, dimension coming into, into the equation, it's uh, multi-platform capabilities. You uh, have to take care about different device capabilities if you provide your um, so, so solution. Um, for iOS, it's, it's handleable, it's, it's okay, but um, our support for Android, this is really tough to, uh, to make sure um, the applications run good on, on every device. And um, this can also have an impact on your servers and your clouds and your, your backend. Um, one, one approach for this is, um, for example, if you're using uh, a lot of HTML5 or providing a mobile web solution, is to <coughs> not put all the logic um, into, into the app to decide what to use, but the first request Sends, sends to the server, hey, I'm this device, um, please give me the right, the right app. So the server can decide, okay, I need to use this JavaScript, maybe this HTML, um, and maybe I don't provide this functionality, but provide it in a different way. So this content negotiation and yeah, consideration of different device capabilities is becoming an important factor here. Also, debugging and logging can be really difficult and challenging with mobile devices. Um, especially at, in the background here, I put this location theme. Uh, it's, um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really tough if you're building a location-based solution because the, the time which location fixed you, you get uh, and to what quality this, you can't predict that. Sometimes it happens, uh, usually the location providers in your phones will cache the last valid location they got. So um, I had this one example on, on a conference where somebody told me he got into the plane in Frankfurt and he checked his his, his uh, Facebook something, and then um, he was flying to, to London. He ordered, ordered a taxi with the taxi app there, and the taxi arrived at the Frankfurt airport. <laughs> 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 because yeah, the last location was, was cached. And um, it's these gray hair here, they come from debugging location based problems. <laughs> and, and I had really full hair. <laughs> 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 and it's, 
that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, debugging and, and logging is really one of the toughest <coughs> things. And maybe you should uh, think about something on the server side, also to send data to your server, to a central place, where you can collect the data to dive into to, to the problems and to the debugging. Because you never know when you have the device or the data from the device to do, this, do some uh, investig investigation here. Scalability and performance, it's bold here. Um, because this might be one of the most interesting and challenging topics. Um, like I said, we have some really extreme cases uh, for, for scalability and performance, especially when we are, when you're thinking about uh, widgets for Android <coughs> and data synchronization. Uh, this synchronization architecture has the side effect that maybe at, at a certain time, it's a lot of data you have to to, uh, to transmit. So, um, and your servers and your backends uh, should be prepared for this. Or if you have, have a solution where you back up some data, um, if you back up, we have one cloud-based storage solution where users can back up their, um, their, their camera roll to the servers. And camera the roll. camera roll, uh, the, cap, uh, the pictures oh, you the picture, take with, okay. with your um, <coughs> phone. And, so as the, yeah, the, and, and the cameras are getting better and better. Ten, 5 megapixels, 10, 15, and so these are huge pictures. And if you have to synchronize this with the server, um, your servers better be ready for this because it's, yeah, it's really it's an extreme case. <coughs> so, yeah, especially also if you're developing for tablets, the resolutions which you might need there are really different than for, for, for smartphones. So I give you an example of uh, for for extreme scalability issue. Uh, can you spot on this diagram when you think something strange happened? <laughs> I think this is strange, right? So from one day to the other, instead of having five million. 5 million requests per day, we had 30 million requests per day. Valentine's Day on a porn site? <laughs> <laughs> this might have been. <laughs> so uh, I would be happy to say this was uh, due to a very successful marketing campaign of ours, <laughs> but unfortunately it was due to, to a very simple bug. <laughs> and um, uh, actually, it was a timestamp for when to renew the data, and the timestamp was was deleted. So, so it always requested new data instead of uh, twice a day. It requested it every minute. So, uh -huh. Wow! And this was one line of code. It was wrong. Yeah. So you were getting data from the server with a timestamp, and so yeah. and the data being returned didn't have the timestamp, and so by default, your client side code. Wow! Yeah, usually, usually the timestamp from the data got saved, yep. and there was a bug when the saved timestamp was deleted That's on the client, client side. side right? So the client said, oh, I don't have a timestamp, so let's get the data. Okay. Very simple, not very unusual bug. I mean, things like this uh, can happen, but the important thing to, to, to I wanted to show you here is that um, it took us five days till things got back to normal. But the fix was done within two minutes. How many clients for this particular service? Uh, I think this for one million. Oh, it is a large service. Okay. Yes, it's it's a it's a large service, one million clients, and <coughs> um, yeah, your backend, your service, you better be be able to to cope with this, because um, fortunately the users didn't didn't see any problem. For them, <laughs> the the solution worked. <coughs> they didn't have a bad experience. <coughs> they were happy. Oh, I got fresh data all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the data center and uh, the guys from the infrastructure, 
and they got really mad at me. <laughs> and they, they had a problem with the battery. So. Yeah. And the, the important thing is here, uh, the, the fix uh, could be done really fast, but it had to be rolled out into, into the uh, Google Play market. And the time it took for the users to update the application was five days. So even if you have a solution, if you build a, a, a server uh, website application, if you experience something like this, you fix it on the server and, and everything's fine, you're done. But if you're providing mobile solutions, especially na native solutions where you roll out the code uh, to, the, to the users, um, you better be ready for some some tough times. So this is roughly what I wanted to. So in this case, it's a force update for all the clients. And fortunately, uh, the application didn't have the mechanism to force the update. So it was just in the Google Play. <coughs> please, please, please update this application. Uh -huh. so, and so within five days, like ninety percent of people did it. Yeah. So what is your opinion of having the app download, for instance, updated Java classes automatically through the connection? Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 depend, it depends really, really on, on, on your app. Uh -huh. I, I don't like very much this, that it's totally dynamic, uh -huh. uh, also because of security uh -huh. considerations. And, um, also, maybe if the client does not know that things are changed, <coughs> he gets totally different app, so uh -huh. truly different behavior. Um, it's, it's really very, yeah, it's more a stomach feeling. Okay. Most, them, the, most of the platforms don't allow you to do it anyway, so it uh -huh. doesn't matter. Yeah. Yes. So but actually, actually one, one way to, to, to do this is uh, each platform has, has a JavaScript engine, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, very often you create your logic not very often, but sometimes people put all the logic into JavaScript mm -hmm. and use this as a business logic engine and then inject it into the apps and use that to execute <coughs> the logic. And if there's something, the business rules change, they set them a different JavaScript. And it's a valid approach, but I think you have to be, be careful, especially if you think about if you change too much also for the user experience, it's, oh, I didn't update this, I didn't sign up for this, uh, I don't want this, why is this different? Or maybe, uh, why did my, uh, my, my, my data connection, my, uh, the plan I have, instead of transferring five megabyte per day, now I'm transferring 10, mm -hmm. because you introduced a new feature, maybe that needed more data. And it's okay, but you, you have to think about it if it's really, really necessary. My, my personal opinion. <coughs> so, um, so one, one question I have for you, one of the points you're missing in terms of issues is power consumption. Yes. Something that most of the developers forget about and it's the number one thing they should be learning. I will get to that in oh, the okay. best practices. <laughs> 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 At least for, for one example. <laughs> So, it's two slides. <laughs> um, so maybe some some best practices from from our experience. Um, if you build a server side solution for for a mobile app, uh, stick to standardized and proven protocols, and um, make sure you design for efficiency in respect to data size and uh, data, data format. And if you transfer data, think about if, is it possible to transfer only Delta data, only data which has changed in the meantime. I mean, this is not new, but uh, it, it's becoming more and more important for, for mobile applications because of the limitations. And um, we made some, some really good experience with, with applying RESTful architectural style for this, also the testability. Uh, T is, is very good, and the reuse between the different platforms is very easy. In Android, HTML uh, solutions or 
uh, iOS, BlackBerry, whatever platform, if you provide your services as RESTful in a RESTful style, HTTP based, it's really easy on each platform to consume these services. And we have a lot of reuse here. Um, have you seen anyone successful use so far more? Um, yes, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, for example, in, in the mobile payment sector, um, a lot of those services for the credit cards and clearing houses, etc., they still only offer soap based uh, service. Uh, yeah, WSDL, DevStar. Uh, services, so, uh, but it's really cumbersome on a mobile device, and um, yeah, JSON, for example, as, as, a, as, as a data format, uh, it's really easy to parse and really fast on, on every device. Maybe one thinks, okay, you can't build graphs, you only can build uh, Tree. trees, you don't have this reference, but I mean, this isn't, it, from my experience in practice, it, this wasn't really a isn't really a limitation. It's namespaces is maybe one thing which you sometimes miss with JSON, but uh, there are ways around this. Um, just, just as, as your API evolves, you need to think about the API. So JSON, like my experience with JSON, is people don't think about the API and it becomes a gigantic mess. But I know I'm unpopular there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. is, is the situation with that any better with? alternative to uh well so of course because you validate the the data you can do a you can describe it but jason you don't describe your message so I have one, one, well, one funny project especially in, in the payment sector where i had the same discussion with a customer <coughs> and i said don't we use the soap and wscl to validate everything just to find out that on the production system their own messages weren't valid against the wscl <laughs> so, uh, it, it's, it's a tool which can, yeah. that can help you, but it does not enforce it. Right? No. It's, it, you have to do this on an organizational level to really make sure uh, you have to meet some kind of uh, certification. Yeah, it's the process. same kind of thing. I mean, you should send valid responses and you should think about your API. You can you always shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah. But also, going back to what he said earlier, right, Stanley, where version. If you don't put version information in the data you're sending right from day one, you're going to be in trouble no matter what yeah. happens. So whether you use JSON or anything else, it doesn't matter. You need to have an identifier that says, hey, I'm version one, version two, and so on. So it's a, lot, a lot of these questions are really organiza more organizational um, challenges more than technological. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And if you have good, good developers and a good communication with the people creating the clients for your service, this shouldn't be too much of a problem. If you look at all these uh, clients which use Twitter, for example, of, of Facebook, they offer JSON-based uh, RESTful a APIs. So th there aren't big problems there with, <coughs> with the data format and validity. It's really easy to use. You can use curl to, to build your uh, solution. So you're really fast in the beginning maybe to build the service, but uh, to make it more stable, you have to spend some time to get the data right, to figure out all, all this uh, yeah, validation. You might spend some time later, then maybe this is the trade-off here. And um, yeah, one very important thing is uh, you should learn to love the HTTP specification. Um, there are things like uh, caching, uh, cache control, had us to use e-tags, uh, the use of proxies and status codes. Why is that? Because uh, the internet itself, the World Wide Web, is the biggest working and most highly scalable REST implementation. Right? So it's really proven that this architectural style scales end endlessly and can be used by all kinds of, of clients. And they are changing fast. Yeah. Mm. New versions, uh, new phones coming out. So um, we really try to use as much as possible for building our services from the HTTP specification. The status codes, 
the headers which are already available instead of needing to create our own caching mechanism. Just put a squid or a web proxy in front of your servers and use the um, HTTP header information. And this is proven, it works. <coughs> you, you, you've actually made several references, this entire slide seems to make a lot of references to, to sticking with HTTP. I'm kind of curious, what else is there out there? I mean, on a mobile platform, what, was somebody going to open a socket? Yeah. Or uh, TCP actually, yeah. um, actually uh, sometimes you, you do this. Uh, oh. For example, for, for gaming, if you're building a peer-to-peer -peer networks, uh, and sometimes HTTP is too, too cumbersome, right? too, too cumbersome. Yeah, you, you open direct socket mm -hmm. connections. Oh, okay. so for, for, for Bluetooth connections, if you uh, integrating with Bluetooth devices or something like this, there are other things where you come back to socket connections. Okay. They, like BlackBerry has BBM channels and it's free versus mm -hmm. using anything else which isn't. So it's there are different communication needs. Well, sorry, I, yeah, I, I just in, didn't even know there were other protocols people seriously consider. In, 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 in my opinion, HTTP is when you're talking to a remote server in the internet. Right. Uh, I, I think for me this is the default to use unless I have a specific requirement not to use HTTP. And from an architectural perspective, also uh, there's some uh, when you're thinking about service integration, sometimes you have have an app and you have different services which you want to consume and you put all the APIs, all the SDKs into your app and integrate with your server, but this brings uh, a lot of, of problems as if one service changes, you have to change your, your mobile app, but your mobile app is distributed via the App Store, so you need two weeks to roll out the new version. You, you have to keep everything in sync, so all the problems I mentioned um, are very valid for this type of architectural approach. So you might think of providing something like, like a mobile gateway, maybe, and doing a lot of your integration on this your own mobile gateway and your own mobile backend, and um, provide a unified and very simple interface to your mobile application, which can be shared maybe on different platforms. But do the heavy lifting <coughs> and all the complex stuff with the, all the integration stuff. Uh, still on the server side. But you, you're, from a security standpoint, that hurts, right? I mean, it's the easiest way. I mean, that's the way you want to go, but for security, you can't do this. Yeah, it, it, it's it, more difficult. Yeah, it's, it's more difficult. I, I agree. But on, on this other side, from a security perspective, it can even be a little bit better sometimes, because Maybe um, if you think about these being internal enterprise services, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe you're not mm -hmm. exposing every endpoint, but you're exposing just one endpoint, which you can control, which you can, uh, yeah, you don't have to take care. Yeah, I'm Maybe just thinking about the authentication token for each of the different services. That's where, yeah, if it's and all if internal. Yeah, this is yeah. the way to go. And if you need to save, uh, save it on, on your server, this, uh, yeah, this can be a problem. So, um, yeah, using that approach, um, it's uh, we use Keep Logic and Truth on the server. Um, it helps you for multi-service integration, um, especially in regards to update cycles and usage of different APIs. If one API of one service changes, you don't have to roll out a new mobile app. You don't have to change every client. But I think this these things <coughs> are true since several years in the. Uh, Enterprise, Java enterprise sector, so, so this is nothing, nothing new to you. But uh, a nice thing is that if you, if you could standardize the interfaces to consume the services with your own mobile gateway, for example, um, you enable this, these services also for, for reuse for native and mobile, mobile web apps. <coughs> for example, let's see. Um, Earlier you mentioned about the uh, AMBAS or a mobile uh, backend as yeah. a service. 
So there are quite a few companies in that space, Parse.com, for example, Firebase, mm -hmm. uh, Stock Marlins, uh, quite a few actually, they're very gaining momentum. So what's your experience with those things? Two slides. I think now I'm getting to the uh, power consumption topic. So, um, what about connection management? I think versus, yeah, I've done this. I wrote 100 uh, of desktop browser apps, and if I want to get data, I open the connection to my server. And, and I get my data, so I do the same on <coughs> a mobile device. For example, Android, it's Java. We use the same code to do this integration. But uh, there's a very big difference between these two because uh, mobile devices, they actually, uh, they have a state machine. And um, this means whenever you want to make a connection, there are three states on a mobile device. One is the radio is, is idle, so it's in low power consumption mode. Then you're opening a connection, want to trans transmit some data, you're getting into this uh, full power state where the data is transmitted, and after a while, there's some, some time when nothing happens, the, the radio will go in, into this um, half power state, consuming less, less battery, and then maybe after, after a couple of seconds go back to, to the idle state. And every time you run through this cycle from, from idle to full power, uh, this drains your battery. This is, um, yeah, you can really easily uh, drain an, iOS, an iPhone battery in an hour if you do this all the time. So, um, well, this is why I said power to me is, is <coughs> as big of an issue of all the items we had before because that's just one of the dimensions that power is an issue. Yeah. Background threads, you know, if you're doing decoding, doing it on the server versus the device, you know, all those types of things. So that's why I think power deserves to be a first class citizen at the, yeah, the level I, I you're at. A little, little out because I wanted to focus more on this integration with the server mm -hmm. and more this connectivity things with the integration, but, but you're absolutely right. Uh, power consumption, background services, uh, this is a big topic. I mean, this is one of the reasons why you can do it uh, on, on an iOS device, for example, why Apple or Windows Phone, it wasn't possible. I don't know about Windows 8 right now, um, but it wasn't possible to, to create background threads <coughs> you would drain your battery immediately. Yeah, ADD has a good um, good tool actually to look into that stuff, which we call ARO, uh, I think yeah. it's a free tool. Yeah. ARO. So, maybe uh, some, some best practices here. Um, whenever possible, reuse connections, because creating connections is, is an expensive thing. Um, many, uh, APIs and frameworks um, make it easy to use persistent connection. This means once you have a connection to your server, uh, you can reuse it for, for more requests. And um, if possible, and if your server supports it, um, you can use pipelining. This means instead of um, you reuse one connection, and instead of sending your requests sequentially, you can send your requests all at once through one connection and if your server supports it, um, this will, will work. And the idea is really to keep your data in flight. Meaning once your radio is, is in full power mode, um, get your work with the network <coughs> integration done. So uh, if you have to download several documents or do several requests, open one connection, do all your requests, and then work with the data instead of saying, Okay, uh, whenever I, I do it lazily, yeah. this really can drain drain your battery. So you have to think about uh, connection management. What you might not do for, for a desktop application, right? Yeah. I have I mean, Wi-Fi, I have Ethernet connection. Whenever I need data, I get it. So here it uh, might be a good point to, to, 
to make sure that you think about when is the next slot you make connection to your server and get as much work done in that slot as possible. So okay. what about uh, push notification? How does this light table affect that? Um, the push notifications are uh, triggered from from the carrier, from, from the, for example, the Apple Cloud or Azure Cloud. And uh, as far as I know, they uh, don't use the, the radio connection here. They, um, it's on the control signal. It's the same thing as SMS. It's really, yes. it's, really it's, nice. it's, it's, a, it's another radio. It's not the one which is used to make the uh, internet connection, the, the connection from your to the radio. It's the same line. radio, but it's the one that communicates with the tower to see how good the signal is. It's a control connection. So it's, it's really nice. Control. So it's not going to drain the battery as much. Um, Correct. It's it's doing it anyway, yeah. 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 So, um, and so, I mean, latency here, sorry, I don't mean that. Latency is also a big issue. I mean, when we had a system we were building where we do a login request and verification and then do a synchronization. And the synchronization could be like 64K of data. This is back in 2G land. And it turns out that it, it, I could download just as much data in one single, doing the login request and getting the sync data back immediately than doing it in two separate requests. It could take up to 60 seconds, and it took me 10 seconds to do the exact same amount of data, but doing it in one. So latency is a really big issue with this kind of stuff. Um, another thing to consider in here is to uh, make sure that you check for reachability changes in your in your app. Um, if if you don't that you don't have connectivity, there are frameworks in the different uh, mobile OS uh, frameworks where you can find out: Am I on uh, Wi-Fi? Am I on 3G? Uh, am I disconnected? So if you know that you're not connected, um, yeah. Don't try to make the calls, or if you know I have to transfer a lot of data, and uh, it's from a use case perspective, it's valid to do this when I have a Wi-Fi connection and wait maybe to do the call. Um, yeah, take this into consideration. Is that is that something that's only realistically available in native apps, or you know, I'm actually going to probably be ending up on a phone gap app pretty soon, so I'm kind of curious. A lot of the things you mentioned seem like they're pretty low level. Um, on PhoneGap, you, you can do it you can, by okay. providing a na native module. Uh, in PhoneGap, you, you can create native modules okay. for each platform, and you can integrate them into PhoneGap. Okay. So, so you do get to call the native services to find things like this? Yes. Now. The native service will run, will find, for example, the reachability change, and then can notify your, your, your browser, okay. the JavaScript, that uh, you might not send this jQuery Ajax request now. It just seems like a lot of the pain points that you've talked about in this at the high level are obviated by going with something like PhoneGap, but then again, you lose, you know, you lose the ability to have the sensitivity of all the lot of issues you guys mentioned. PhoneGap will build your back end for you to make sure that all of these things get covered. So I, I would be careful on how you're thinking about that. Um, okay, I, that wasn't, I was talking about on the client side. So with phone gap, uh, you're always running in, in, a, in a browser, mm -hmm. in, um, and so this is really an abs abstraction. So you don't usually have that much control, but uh, this brings all the problems. And if you want to have that control, you can use phone gap, but you're still you're running very code. And you're back to doing things native. Okay. So it's uh, it's possible. So it's not that. You can do the phone gap, but uh, you don't get it out of the box. Okay. Also, if you're programming native, you don't get it out of the box. You have to write some code for it, and you have to build it into your application logic to take care of these things. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, another aspect here is um, mobile development. It's a highly innovative area. It's we have extremely fast moving technology. Uh, twice a year, a new SDK for each platform. And uh, new features, 
new possibilities, new use cases there. And um, from our experience, we are uh, also doing uh, agile and lean consulting for our customers and training for Scrum Masters, etc. And um, from our point of view, this is really great field to apply these methodologies because they take into consideration the things that you have moving targets and things change. And um, from a technology perspective, yeah, you have to make sure that you have adaptable um, technology and an adaptable architecture. This is why, why I talked so much about this, uh, open standards and HTTPS and things where you know um, yeah, you can use them to your needs. They don't lock you in. So this is a huge opportunity, this area. Uh, the markets and markets website said that this backend as a service. Okay, if, if you put it all down, it comes out to, hey, we need some, some cloud, some middleware, something which can uh, help me to, to provide all these, these services and uh, solve or address all these, these issues and, and challenges. So one way to, to address this are uh, uh, backend as a service solutions. This is a huge market and it should become bigger. And at the moment, if you look at the ecosystems from all, all areas, um, companies, technologies are moving into this, this sector. We have service providers going in this direction. We have uh, handset OEMs, <coughs> SDKs, and um, different platform providers. At the moment, they are free free services uh, that might be, I might point out here, which are very uh, prominent. And Firebase is also free, but it's beta. Uh, okay. So they have a pricing structure. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I don't know Firebase. So um, I think Kinbase, uh, StackMob, and Pass yeah. might be the, yeah. uh, the ones which you might have heard of already. Yeah. So which already to use uh, services are there. Kinway, a big player, uh, it offers you data, data storage, uh, user management, push notification, location services, geofencing. You're able to create business logic on the cloud service and expose that logic via REST interfaces. There are ways to um, integrate external data sources. They use the S3 uh, Amazon cloud for providing large, large files and analytics, etc. Another big player is Pass. Uh, they mainly concentrated in the beginning on data store and dynamic data store. Um, as a mobile developer, this is really great because sometimes you build your app and you want to get some data from a from server, but the server is not, not there yet. Your, your server side implementation is not finished. So one way to, to, to do this is to mark the data and or to provide some example data and pretend as if you have the service. So we use this <coughs> dynamic uh, data storages a lot uh, during development. Just to not necessarily when we're doing development, actually the main intention to to make it so attractive, so easy to use specifically for mobile clients. Yeah. So you provide the data processing same as that. Uh, it's most of the time actually uh, following the key value stores <laughs> idea. So uh, actually, I play with the parse. Uh, there's a free uh, service also available. Mm -hmm. So, so it's it very straightforward. It's very. <coughs> it's, it's great if you know that the data you need here is for your your mobile experience. But very often the data comes from from a different system. Usually the the, the oh yeah, data you need to is nature accordingly, of course. Yeah. I mean, you need to somewhat yeah. integrate to do other integration data steps. sources. That's the thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the, 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 the question is, if if you want to do this integration step, do you want to save your data uh, really on in the cloud, on providers somewhere in the internet, on for on a different comp company? So a lot of our customers don't allow us to use public 
cloud services. Yeah. But this, again, it depends on your requirements. Because so this uh, cloud uh, on-premise installations mm -hmm. and own data centers, etc., <coughs> this is really in, in Germany here a big issue. Mm -hmm. that, that's why these uh, these open and uh, software as a service providers are not very successful, mainly because of uh, uh, data security uh, regulations and laws, which are very very strict. So. For us, we use this mainly for, for development because mm -hmm. it's easy and fast to do that. But uh, and we we define the interfaces and the data structures of this. And once and we have them ready, we say, hey, look, our, set, our, service, our endpoints look like these. The data structure looks like this. This is a blueprint. Do this now uh, on on our own servers. And we just switch the endpoint to the other servers. But uh, it's great to create specifications. Mm -hmm. So, and King Stackmore, enough, another uh, mobile backend as a service approach, and uh, maybe Exeter to point out these guys. Um, they have a great platform, and they are very much focused on this uh, Internet of Things, on this uh, machine to machine communication, and uh, they provide asset management, <coughs> a rules engine, which is nice. You can write a Groovy code, mm -hmm. Groovy scripts and upload them to the cloud and expose these as, as RESTful services. Mm -hmm. They also provide uh, geofencing, uh, location services. Um, you say like geofencing? Yes. What is, what is geofencing? You can um, save location data from the server, and you can write uh, logic, for example, to get notified when another user gets near or into the ra radius. <coughs> okay of this location. There are some ways, some APIs, which make it easy for you to get, get notified or to find out who's, who's in, within the radius of 10 miles from my location. A typical mobile service, right? Mm -hmm. so, so from a data sensitivity perspective, how different is this from sharing your data in uh, Amazon web service? You know, you have a VM in Amazon web service and you persist, persist your data there versus persisting here. Pretty much. Difficult question. Well, I mean, it's the same thing. The difference between platform as a service and software as a service, right? One gives you a machine that you got to figure out is always working, versus this one's making sure that data is actually being stored. And so it's it's a completely different mentality in terms of the service will always store data. Versus is your virtual machine running? Is your your GE stack running? Is your database running? And so on. Yeah, so the security risk is pretty much the same. Doesn't matter. Correct. 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 Well, and, and Amazon has all kinds of offerings. I mean, they don't just have EC2. They have managed data mm -hmm. stores. And no, but he was specifically asking about, like, he said virtual machine, right? So mm -hmm. if your host, if you're willing and able to do that, then... I think if you're using more of these platform as a service, um, you have more responsibility, and but also more flexibility to build your, your apps to your needs. Mm -hmm. But... Um, you have to do all the painful work there, which might have been al already been done by these uh, software as a service providers. But with the risk, hmm, it's not. It's maybe a eighty percent solution of what I want. So I think this is this is maybe the, the trade off: how much control uh, and how much customization you need to have for the solution. But maybe it's there's no this is better or this is better. It's as, as usual, it always depends on your requirements, right? Or do you get paid by the hour? <laughs> right. <laughs> the requirements of the CFO then. <laughs> so, um, just to mention, another big player coming up with lots of services, uh, Accelerator. Um, you might want to have a look at uh, the side of those guys. Uh, they bought another um, Backend as a service company, it was Coco, Coco something, um, and they have many many <coughs> services which you can use. I don't know about the pricing one or the other. Is this a company in Titanium? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think they are, they are from from San Francisco. Yeah. So, um, before we have the first break. 
maybe just quickly what existing frameworks are there to develop uh, your mobile cloud solution. Um, maybe you've heard of uh, IBM Worklight. They provide a framework and technology, IBM. Um, it's consistent of, they have their IDE, they have a, a server for integration, uh, some services to, to integrate JSON translation, authentication, some adapters for different protocols, etc. And they have a console for analyzing for debugging to get crash logs, for example, uh, and usage statistics. Uh, they provide services for runtime scaling. This is more low level. Uh, what what they provide to to build your your own solution. I only know this from a marketing perspective, so I don't know the details. But there are also uh, open source <coughs> uh, open source frameworks coming up. One example is Aerovia from uh, it's driven by JBoss, uh, Red Hat, and their goal is to provide a set of APIs, technologies, best practices, frameworks, also to make it easy to build your own um, mobile backend. Yeah, they, um, yeah, for example, provide JavaScript APIs for authentication, uh, registration, uh, a data management manager, and uh, a pipeline, which I mentioned later. It's mainly based on Apache Cordova, so many uh, PhoneGap oh, yeah. phone based solution. Yeah, so I, I haven't done any PhoneGap, I'm just <laughs> asking <laughs> questions. Oh, sorry, <laughs> whoa, phone whoa, guy. whoa. Hello <laughs> <laughs> there, buddy. Actually, I do have a question. Um, you've covered authentication only from, in the sense that it occurs. Have you worked on an app, a mobile app, where you do anything other than name and password, like you do bio, any kind of biometric or, or you know? Anything other than your standard login and, and username? And client certificates. Client, but never anything that uses the phone's ability to sort of extend out at all? Uh, you mean by using the, 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 the provider? The well, well, like for instance, anything is, anything is super cool as taking your picture, yep, that's you, or you know, something that plugs into one of the uh, phones, you know, bi possibly biometrics. Actually? I, I, I realize it's sort of a pie in the sky question, but I, Kind of curious to see if anybody's doing that. That's yeah. Yeah. Actually, I can give you a short example, maybe. We have one person we can take a card, okay. it's like credit card, and we have this area here. <coughs> Put your card, card in it, and then you're scan authenticated. It. Mm. It's scan. It's <laughs> using, what is it? It's, it's a QR code. code. No, there's no QR. Well, well, yeah, how does it, how does it recognize it? That's the magic. Lock the door, we'll be there. And for $50,000, I can have an answer. Looks like it's using the touch screen. Yeah, yeah it's multi-touch. Yeah, oh, wow. There's some encoded uh, cryptographic information oh, on wow. here, and I can, uh, it's, Oh, so the touch, touch interface. Touch oh, wow. That's uh, cool. So it acts like basically like a fingerprint. Um, yes, yeah. basically. Oh. With certain timing, probably. But this, this is one yeah. of, uh, yeah, for one customer, they're doing this uh, in the payment area, using That's this for really mobile cool. payments, uh, but also for brand verification. When, if you buy a Rolex, I don't have a Rolex, yeah. but <laughs> yeah, you get this, uh, you can, you don't have to put it on plastic. You can also put it on paper. Mm -hmm. uh, but you need conducted. this special, uh, this special company to print it for you. Mm -hmm. You can do this with with any printer. You need this company to produce. This is how they make the money. They produce mm -hmm. the, uh, the the cards yeah. and uh, <coughs> the brand verification. So you can put it on an app. <coughs> the Rolex app says, "Yeah, your uh, your watch is is an original." Also, if you're interested in doing two-factor auth, the Google Authenticator is pretty <coughs> straightforward to integrate with. I'm seeing that used more and more. Again, I'm only asking from you know, a curiosity perspective. I don't have a direct need for this, but I, one of the things that I see mobile apps as, as being really useful <coughs> for is sort of pushing out into our like a presence space, you know, that's the best way I'd call it. 
this kind of stuff. And I say this as a guy who's been doing, you know, services development for 12 years. I'm, I'm not a front end guy. So. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Arukio, yes, it makes it easy for you to, to build. It's mainly focused at the moment on HTML5 solutions, but it also provides some native SDKs uh, and also some server side components, which make it easy for you to integrate with with uh, with uh, servers. They have an abstraction layer on top of REST and web sockets called pipelines they use to communicate. And um, if you install the, the, the JBoss tools, for example, you can pretty easily get, create those um, jQuery mobile apps, which already uh, use a lot of these JavaScript and CSS APIs and technologies for making this adaptive and flexible uh, layouts. This is the same application. Uh, and it renders differently on the different devices. And this is really easy to do with, <coughs> with Arrowdia. Uh, OK, we have native APIs, server side. But honestly, it's in a very early stage. I wouldn't recommend to use this uh, in production at the moment. But uh, I know these guys, and they are working, working hard to get this um, to be a competitor for, for IBM Workline. And um, actually, at the moment, I'm, I'm talking with the lead of the project <coughs> also to, to shift the focus a little bit more on providing services, like this uh, user management, data storage, authentication, and put the focus more on the product and not so much on the technology and how you abstract the APIs. So uh, there's a lot of things going on. That uh, authentication method was kind of interesting. So most of those devices can uh, register up to five finger points, basically, to the power of five. It's going to be um, 32 different variations. But also, I assume, because of the special orientation of the touch points, maybe determining how, how the authentication could be done, right? right? That's so interesting. I'd like to look at that one. Geometric uh, yeah. patterns. And which which can be read, yeah. but you need a special, a special, special some card. sort of conduct material maybe. It will, I think it will get your static electricity in your hand, and you touching it, it will just conduct to that specific point, right. which you will read it. Okay. And it's really different for, for iOS. On iOS, it works pretty well. On Android, it only works on some devices because the touch. Because not all, not all of them are registering. You know, yeah. most of them are fit, just in five finger points. A lot of devices are two and three yeah, so, so, so it's really it's not a solution for for everything. Okay. But um, on on iOS it works pretty yeah. well. So okay, uh, this Arabia stuff. Uh, I wouldn't use it for for native development at the moment. But if you're prototyping uh, mobile web solutions. Uh, and if you just want to play a little bit with, with new technology, this might be a good starting point for you. And uh, once you have your, your great application, you want to roll out it, uh, roll it out, and you want, want to use it, or during development, you need some server to integrate with. And um, also, I discovered Open, the OpenShift project from, from, from Red Hat, <laughs> and uh, I loved it. And I was, because I was able uh, within five minutes to get an um, application server and DB stack running and um, you just deploy by, by pushing into Git repository and things are deployed on your server and you just check, check um, some a check mark there and you get a Jenkins uh, CI tool chain activated which builds uh, your stuff and for, for for creating these kind of applications during development, maybe to, to run the solution in the end. Uh, I thought this was, was a great was a great solution. So I think we will make the break now. And thanks for your attention. And uh, then we will dive into some some technology and some source code and a little bit deeper into that stuff.
Thanks.